So I'm really interested in drawing. So what does it mean? My background is in uh, fine arts. I studied painting and printmaking before I went to Parsons. I was at Hunter College. I loved it. I spent all my time making art and I, um, I fell in love with animation, using the computer to do animation. So I discovered Flash and Action Script, and then I wound up going to Parsons, uh, being in the DT program, and discovered just this love of like, uh, that you could write code and make something move. So uh, a lot of my projects are about movement and animation and trying to find some poetry in that. So I'll show some drawing related projects and then kind of talk about sketching. Um, this is a really early project, but it means a lot to me. I think it kind of explains what I'm interested in as an artist. The, for this project, John, I'm on stage painting, and the audience can see what I'm painting behind me. So it's um, it's like a camera from above looking at the painting, and then the audience can see the painting uh, projected behind me. And this project is inspired by Thomas Edison and John Stuart Blackton. This is a film from 1905 called The Enchanted Drawing. And here you can see a drawing come off of a piece of paper. So using stop camera technique, you see a drawing and then the this person draws it and then grabs it from the paper. So the drawing kind of comes to life. Or um, Helena Almeida would take black and white photographs and add blue paint. So here she paints a blue dot, she picks it up, she eats it and she cries blue tears. And I love this idea of paint as something physical, as something you could touch. So I would do this performance where I'm on stage painting and then I can touch the painting and the painting kind of comes to life. So, um, so I'm really, it's real ink, I'm really painting on paper and then it's a, a, in a way a kind of magic trick where I make the, the, the illusion that this painting that I just made can, can move and you can touch it and use your fingers and use your body. And a lot of the work that I do is about kind of body, using gesture, using the body as inputs and finding ways to create these kind of immediately understandable interfaces. So you touch the dot and the dot moves, it's, imme it's immediately understandable, but how can you make something that's really kind of playable and malleable? So I did this performance and I was on stage, you know, every day, um, we were on tour in Japan, I would be on stage performing, and the, afterwards the audience would come up, they would all want to try it. So I decided to make a version for people to try themselves. And I really like making installations where you invite people to become performers, where they can, they can come and step up and, and participate and perform. And so you know, usually for like performance, you take people on a journey and you have a structure of time. And the performance uh, installations, you're inviting people to become performers. So here people could, paint and then interact with their painting. I'm gonna make a drawing and, and touch it and see it move. Um, and there's something that I got really excited about using these projects. And I, I call this the open mouth phenomenon. So I just want to mention, um, this is uh, in a festival for children called Cinekid. So this is number one, number two, number three, and number four. This is what I'm interested in as an artist, that I always think about how do I, how can I communicate? Like what, you know, as an artist, you gotta often um, ask to write an artist statement, like in words, how do you describe what you're interested in? And I always think about this photo as a way of communicating what I'm really interested in, which is creating moments of wonder, that I would make the argument that if you can make somebody's mouth open, you can reach their hearts. Uh, another drawing, project that I did was with Google, they came to me and they had these satellite photographs from around the world. And I had developed this kind of technology um, earlier for um, a project that I did uh, with local projects in a, a, a design studio in New York. We did, had done it for a Cleveland Museum of Art and for a Cooper Hewitt. And I had a chance to revisit it. And, and for this project, I used drawing as an interface for these satellite photographs. So the basic idea, um, behind this algorithm that I had been working on is that you draw a line and when you draw a line, it matches that line in some photograph from around the world. So if you draw a straight line, it'll find a straight line. If you draw an angle, it'll find an angle. If you draw a rectangle, it'll find a rectangle. But in this case, what you're doing is you're using drawing as a, as a mechanism for search, using this gesture as a kind of input to a system that's searching through a database of images. And projects like this, they always have this kind of pretty front end 
So like design front end. And then a lot of the work, a lot of my day to day is quite like laborious. Like I'm, I'm doing a lot of data analysis. I'm thinking about how to matching algorithms and, and so on. And I really enjoy this sort of conversation between like, what is the output? What are the, what is the behind the scenes? And what is the, what is the kind of front, front of the, yeah, I guess it's back end and front end in a way. Um, what is it, what, is, what does it look like? How do people interact with it? And, uh, and I think it's oftentimes as a artist in this medium, I go spend my time bouncing back and forth. The second part of this project is connecting dominant lines. So it's taking like a coastline, a highway, a river in an image. And as you drag to the right or you drag to the left, it's connecting all these satellite photographs from around the world. So creating almost a kind of infinite canvas and, uh, and connecting these parts. And these are real places, you know, these are photographs around the world. So you can click on that link, you could go to Google Earth and, and see it. Another project, um, and I've worked on Richard with this, is called InkSpace. So this is a um, Android app. I think in this uh, moment, Google was trying to show kind of creative coding in Android world. So they said, you know, what would you like to do? Uh, and I suggested this tool, which would be based on drawing, and usually when you draw, you draw on a kind of flat surface. And the interesting thing about the phone is that it has all these sensors. It has a, an accelerometer, it has a gyro, which means that we can use those. We can use the data from the phone to inform the drawing. So here you make a drawing and when the drawing rotates, when the phone rotates, the drawing rotates in 3D. So usually you think about drawing on a kind of flat surface, but here you could use the movement of the phone to rotate the drawing. So you're creating a kind of 3D form just using the, the data that you get from the accelerometer, from the gyroscope, um, and then using that to kind of drive and, and control animation. And there's something that I find really magical about building tools that allow other people to express their creativity. So, you know, you put a tool like this out and you see drawings that people make, and oftentimes they're very kind of silly, childish, um, there's a lot of stuff like this, which I really love. Um, and, but then sometimes you see this thing where um, there's this woman from South Korea, she drew this bird. And I, I couldn't imagine how she did this when I saw this the first time. And I was really like, spent a lot of time just staring at this drawing. For me, it's kind of like, you know, really beautiful. If you make tools, I think it's just really, um, the joy is just in seeing how other people bring their creativity and their ingenuity to the tools that you make. I want to talk quickly about um, daily sketching. So I, um, I love animation. And in particular, I love just trying to think about how motion can create emotion, how, you, how through movement you can create different feelings. And so I have started this process for about four years now where every day I make a small sketch and I post it on Instagram. So I am essentially coding something, writing software in open frameworks and then screen recording it and posting it and sharing that as a kind of daily exercise. And there are some motivations. One motivation for this is these um, 10 rules for students by um, Sister Corita Kent. These are some kind of popularized as John Cage's rules, but they're really written by Sister Corita Kent. And these rules are great. I think they're just really useful as a student generally, but I like for, in the case of sketching, the rule seven, the only rule is work. If you work, it will lead to something. And for me, I just try to be kind of making and making and making as much as possible. Um, I saw this kid on the subway and he had a phone out and he had a camera and the snap spectacles. So he is, this, for me, this was such an amazing moment that he's got his, he's taking a photo of his phone but there, like how many cameras are there in this moment? Like he has, you know, three or four cameras and then I have my phone taking a picture of him. And I feel like artists need to be like that, like taking photographs of everything you do. So a lot of times when I'm doing the daily sketches, I feel like I'm a, like a wildlife photographer and I'm just trying to take screenshots and video of all the things that I make. And I have one folder on my hard drive which is 300 gigabytes, which is every photograph, every image as I'm making, they all go in there. It's called every day. And, uh, and then I can, for me, I you just try to capture everything I, I create. 
Um, the other motivation is this thing called ABI. It's kind of based on this movie. A, B, C. A always, B, B, C closing. Always be closing. Always be closing. But for me, it's the act of doing daily sketches is kind of, it's about iteration and, and essentially like doing the same thing over and over again. Um, and I really find a lot of joy in iterating and saying that I'm going to just make small changes and say, what is the smallest change that I can make to something to, to make something new? I think this, I always show this picture in talks. I think it's so beautiful just to describe the result of that. So this kid had to write, I will make better choices over and over again. And by the end, you can see it's just a single L for the, the single line for the L, a single line for the stem on the M, you know, and, and if you have to do something repeatedly, you will do, you will optimize, you will take shortcuts. And, um, and as an artist, as a designer, those shortcuts become your style. They become who you are as a creator. So I started sketching and I was thinking a lot about light and reflection. So in particular, kind of where is the light coming from and just simulating light. And what does it look like if rays of light were bouncing off a wall and um, you know, how, how, what would that kind of look and feel like? And every morning I would show this to my daughter. She was six at the time. And she would say, you know, this is great. Like, you know, I'm hypnotized. She liked the sketches at the beginning, but then she started to be like, oh, you have to stop. Like, this reflection stuff. So she's kind of my art director. And, uh, and now then I change it up. So I started thinking about blobs and like, how are these blobs moving? And um, these kind of blob shapes, what would they, be, how would they color them? Sometimes you do sketches, like I did this sketch really quickly and people really liked it. And for me, it was this weird moment where I didn't care about it. I didn't think about it, but people liked it a lot more than I did. And sometimes I make things that I like a lot and people don't like. And that, that's really interesting, the mismatch between your ideas, like how you're in and out, out of harmony with the world, I think that's really beautiful. If you can see how you're in and out of harmony, then it's not that you need to make things that people like, but you can just understand, yeah, those, those moments when you're in and out of harmony. Did this, my daughter did not like it. Um, this is, sometimes inspired by different designers. This is Lance Wyman has this amazing um, Mexico uh, lo, uh, identity design for the Mexico 68 uh, Olympics. And I just love these curves. And I got really obsessed with these curves and started thinking about from a code perspective, if you have a shape, how do you offset it? And, and kind of like just exploring this algorithm and I don't, sometimes I don't even know what to do with it. Like I just get kind of obsessed about an idea, about a graphical form or about an algorithm, and then try to push and see what's possible. Or here, thinking about how blobs can interact with other blobs and um, you know, exploring. A lot of times here, uh, this is playing with 3D, trying to make 3D shapes that feel like 2D and 2D that feels like 3D. I'm really interested in kind of ambiguous images, images that are easy to see, but ask your brain to do a bit of work to unpack. Sometimes the sketches are inspired by what I'm feeling. So after Trump was elected and before the new year, I felt like we were living in a kind of cartoon universe. And I wanted to express you know, my deep unhappiness about the political situation and being happy about the new year. And this is the way that I could do that. Or after, um, after Trump was inaugurated, it felt like every weekend we were um, protesting. And so I made this sketch to try to show what it felt like to be out on the street protesting with other people. Like how, you know, we were out at JFK, we were out for the Women's March, and I just wanted to show this kind of pushing, feeling of pushing. And sometimes they're very personal. Like this was um, a sketch I made on the anniversary of my father's passing away. And I found this, um, I found this motion capture data of a person walking. And for me, this single person walking was so was such a great way to um, describe what it felt like to be alone, and then I could use that to um, kind of convey, you know, the, how I was feeling alone, thinking about uh, my father not being here. And sometimes it's very random. I just had a video clip of a hand drawing a line. A lot of times, very graphical, thinking about kind of geometry. 
you know, half circle and circle, or sorry, half circle and straight line, you connect them. And then what happens if you extrude it, revolve it, rotate it, and just kind of playing with geometry and graphical form and trying to see what's possible. Many times inspired by different artists and designers that I come across, like Ruth Asawa is the sculptor and she has these amazing wire sculptures where the, the, they get larger and smaller from, you know, as it goes, down and and I just love this idea of something that is simple as a circle that's expanding and contracting so I'm not necessarily trying to recreate that work but just say is there some element of that work that I could learn from that I could get some insight from and then bring to my practice and try to just be as an artist just try to be a, a sponge and absorb as much as possible and then bring it to your creative practice um, I think that's about 20 minutes the last thing I will say is um, I do um, office hours. So Richard mentioned this um, at the beginning of the call. Um, so I make myself available. It's probably when I started doing the daily sketches at the same time, I was thinking about, for me, this really important moment. When I was a, a student at um, Hunter College, I had this printmaking professor and one of the most beautiful things that he would do is have office hours and he would once a week, he, it was Tuesday afternoons, he would take a lemon poppy seed muffin and he would cut it into slices and he would invite us to come in and just talk to him. And the thing that I found amazing is that I was a, I was a young person, I was 18, I was 19 and he he took us seriously. He took me seriously and he listened. And, and when you're young, when you have an adult that listens and just asks good questions and gets you thinking and cares about what you care about, that for me, that was so important, really a kind of important part of my, my growing up. And so I was thinking, what could I do? How could I do something similar? How could I, yeah, what is the modern day version of that? So I just started tweeting out, um, you know, I'm gonna have office hours. And what I try to do is have two to three hours a week where I make myself available. Um, and in a way it's like, I feel now in this age of COVID, I feel like I was kind of like training myself because a lot of these conversations that I would have with people were over Skype and over Hangouts and, um, and, it, and I was just having these moments weekly where I would talk to people and people would have questions about studying technical questions aesthetic questions and um for me it's just really that's like a i think that the daily sketching is a, a way of saying hello to the world and the office hours for me has been a, a way of listening to the world um and with that i'm happy to take questions and yeah super happy to be here awesome thank you uh, so again, everybody, if you want to ask questions, you can go ahead in chat or just speak or raise your hand and we can ask you to speak. Sorry, I see a bunch of questions, uh, but I'm like, I got to catch up. Yeah. Um, actually, I'll start with one quick question. So yeah. um, to me and maybe for a lot of people here, you're a great example of somebody who does independent work so to say, mm -hmm. so you don't have your own 10 person design studio and you're also not employed by another studio or company. Can you speak about independent practice, what it takes, what are the pros, what are the cons, why, why do you do work the way you do? Yeah, and that's a really good question. Um, I have found, and it took me a, a lot of time to figure this out, is that I, I really, there's three things that I really enjoy, which is teaching, doing artwork and doing commercial work. And these three things are, I always talk about them as being kind of three legs of a stool, that they are, um, they're really important to me. I think a lot about how I use my time and they, they relate to each other. So for example, I take the things that I'm learning when I do commercial work and bring it into the classroom. I take that energy as a teacher, I almost feel like I'm a vampire. Like I wanna get the energy from my students because they're so excited about seeing something new. And then I take that to my art practice. And I take the things I learn 
from my art practice and bring it to my commercial work. And I try to have this very like nice dialogue between these three parts of my life. And I think having my life split up in these ways has meant that it, I haven't like grown. Uh, so for example, like if I was only doing commercial work then I imagine I would have like a big studio with a lot of people and like project managers and many projects. Um, and, and I really like these, doing these things like in conversation with each other. So I've tried to like build a, a practice where I can really focus on the things that I do well and, and try to, um, yeah, have them be in conversation and be in harmony with each other. And I love it. I really love it. It's hard. It was very hard at the beginning. And oftentimes I think it's quite hard to find the right balance, but I personally feel at this moment, like I'm yeah, really balanced. Just to follow up on that and feel free to answer this however you want, mm -hmm. but it's yeah. sustainable. Uh, you're able to pay the bills. Yeah. 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 In this combination. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, um, and the nice thing about teaching is that it's really constant. Right. And especially when I was early days of doing kind of media art stuff and being, I was adjuncting at Parsons, like it was quite helpful to have like a very steady paycheck and health insurance and those sorts of things. And, and I find, yeah, you, you have to do it. You have to manage it properly, but once you do, you can find, you can, you know, have these things work w well together. Cool. I'll read some questions from the chat, but also feel free to pick yeah. whichever. So yeah. did you ever find coding complex when you began or not communicating what you imagined to create? How do you pr bridge the creative gap? Yeah. I mean, it was so, I was the, in, in kind of the coming, you know, to this talk today, I was thinking a lot about those early days, like when I was a student at Parsons, even before I was a student at Parsons. And it was really, challenging when you when there's like a I feel the best way to describe it I would say is that if you ever um, you're driving on a service road next to a highway and you know you're on a slow road but you're you're tracking with the highway and the highway turns and the service road turns and but you're constantly like where is the on-ramp like how do I get on this highway and I remember really vividly this feeling I I wanted so badly to work with pixels when I was just getting started with code, I wanted to work with computer vision. And at that time it was, you know, there was no processing, there was no, these tools were not easy to use, you know, and I was reading through, I don't know, QuickTime for Java documentation. I was like struggling with everything. Um, and I, what I wanted to do was outside of the range of what I could do. And so I really had very clearly had this feeling of like, I'm, I know there's a highway and I know I'm on the side of the highway, but I don't know how to get on the highway. And I think about that metaphor a lot when I'm teaching that I, like my job as a teacher, as an instructor is to try to build those on ramps or help, help point out those on ramps and help students find it. What was the Thomas Edison animation? <laughs> Oh yeah, it's called The Enchanted Drawing by John Stuart Blackpin and Thomas Edison from 1905. There's a series of them, but that's the one that I showed. But there's another one called Funny Faces, which is really great. Um, they're all done with the same kind of stop camera technique. So you draw something, you know, it's very true, um, like er early special effects and, and yeah, very beautiful. And then somebody is asking very specifically, are you taking students in your new lab at MIT? And what's the future oh, of your okay. tenure there? That's, yeah, yeah, that's an interesting question. So I have like a really weird position at the Media Lab, um, which is that I am um, part-time. So I uh, am really, I'm really excited to be there because for me, the Media Lab means a lot to me. I studied with Golan Levin at Parsons, and he was a former student there, student of John Maida, and the sort of tradition of John Maida, Miro Cooper, that that design tradition, like I I relate to it, and I feel really, yeah, it it means it means so much to me, like that that tradition. So I'm happy to be at the Media Lab, kind of representing that. I 
haven't been accepting students because it hasn't been clear how to have a group and how it should work. I'm really advocating for it. So, um, but I, at the moment, I've kind of inherited students. So one of the things at the Media Lab is when you apply, you apply to a group. And so I've, I have some students who have left one group or, you know, and, and so on. And the Media Lab has been, it has been a really crazy year. Um, the start of the year was uh, all of these re revelations around um, money that had come from um, Epstein and um, the director of the lab stepping down. And that was like, it, it was like insane to be teaching there. Like it, I was teaching the first week and it was, it was just insane. It, I, I also, when I was at Parsons was when September 11th happened. And I was, I think that was the second year of my graduate. Um, uh, my um, time at DT and I had been, I was teaching undergrads and that was a crazy moment to teach after, to come in a couple weeks after September 11th and to be teaching students. And the same, th that first week of Media Lab, like it had the same vibe. I was, I was reminded of, of being, of really like what it's like to be in kind of, in a moment of crisis in a university. And this year has been just totally insane between that at the start of the year and COVID at the end of the year, um, it has been, you know, calamitous. So, um, but I'm super happy to be there and yeah, I should have more clarity um, in the future when, especially when we, uh, have, when we all have more clarity. Awesome. Uh, your teaser has a question. I don't know if, how I, to unmute you, but. Hey, I have unmuted. Thank you. Hi, Zach. You Hi. Staff, very curious about the project you showed, the Google project, uh, where you can draw a line, and it uh, yeah. shows you image, like what sort of thing went in the back end of it, because it does it really fast in real time. If you could yeah. just give it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm quite interested in gesture recognition algorithms. This one in particular is based on, there's a really clever and simple algorithm called dollar gesture recognizer um, and it's it's a really f nice paper you can read it there's implementations in like every language and it is basically um, a way where you can make a drawing and it recognizes you draw a triangle and it recognizes a triangle you draw a square to recognize a square and if you're old enough you probably remember palm pilot and graffiti but you all look really young so you don't know what i'm talking about but some of some folks may remember like there was this device and you drew with a um, a stylus and, and, and recognize your drawings. That algorithm has a really nice way of calculating a metric where you take one drawing and another and you say, how close are they? So what I do for that pro for this project is I, I scan all of the images. I look for lines and that's done in an automated way. So I'm doing image processing. Um, I wrote a paper actually about this. So all the technical details are um, if you go to the landline site, you can, I think, click the question mark and there's a technical, like a medium post. Um, and, and then, um, everything is doing line to line matching. Like you draw a line is trying to find a line that's similar. The clever thing in the algorithm is that it is using some algorithms to cut down on the search space because you have, you know, thousands and thousands of lines. So in this case, it's using an al algorithm called VP tree, but we're getting into kind of weedy details, but it, that there's an article that explains all of the kind of behind the scenes uh, magic. And then there's lots of like clever things that we did. For example, the app is progressively loading data. So when you start, it doesn't have all of the data. And as you used it, it's like loading in the background. And, you know, we did a lot of like thoughts about how to make it really responsive. Thank you so much. Of course, much. It, it, it went on the front page of Reddit, and then everybody just wanted to draw penises. And, um, and we have built a, because the, the line can't be that complex, so it, it kind of like the line as you draw, it, it erases from the end. And then people thought we had actually built in a, a penis detection algorithm, and there were like this long Reddit sub thread about, like, about that. So that's what happens when you have drawing projects. And, and they, they make it on the front page of Reddit. Thank you. Another question from Noah. Yeah, hi, Zach. Um, I actually stumbled into this quote of yours yesterday 
I thought was really mm -hmm. interesting. And uh, it says, the main challenge is trying to create work that touches people at an emotional level, as opposed to them thinking about the technology or wondering about how it was made, making poems, not demos. And I'm just, I yeah. it's interesting. I'm wondering like how you kind of approach that work while still working in a medium that is so like mysterious to most of the people that like view your work. Um, yeah. And to see like the poetry in it rather than them like amazed that it was even made in the first place. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I think the main challenge is when you're working with technology, with these sorts of tools, it's easy to get really excited about them and be creating work that's sort of in service of them. So you get like, and, I, and that happens to me a lot. Like I'll get excited about an algorithm or getting excited about a kind of new technique or new technology. And there are a lot of feedback loops that happen as an artist. So if you're an artist working in new media, you know, one of the things that happens is you need to get paid and you have companies like um, Google, Facebook, et cetera, like they're putting money behind artists, but that are, that use technologies that are, they're trying to tell a story with. And it's really difficult. Like if you do something, for example, like if you make a project with machine learning, like the press wants to write about machine learning, like people want to, um, people want to talk about it. And, and you can, the, there's a trap, I think, if you get into a point where you start are creating sort of work in service of the technology that, that you, what you don't want to be doing is being like a demo maker or, ma or sort of showing like being like showing a, a demonstration of the technology, but actually the technology to drive your ideas and be the engine behind the, the sort of beautiful thing that you want to see in the world. And for me, it's always this fine line. And I, the reason I said that quote and the reason I think about it a lot is it is always like, how can the artwork come first? Like, how can, how can the technology be in service of the artwork? For the worst thing in the world for me, or the worst sort of feeling is um, when your work is, 2, comes off as a, as a demo. Yeah, I, ha I had this experience where um, some, somebody wrote an article and they said, they call me an AR kit artist or like, Something that like, it, it was something like, it, that said like ARKit artist like transforms the world into a cubist nightmare. And for me, it was this moment of like, oh fuck, that's like my nightmare, like to be like, you know, that I'm a, that, that the work is in service of the technologies. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, here's one that I think is interesting uh, that Shin yeah. highlighted uh, from Unshuman. What's the advantage of working in creative coding to create designs or illustrations over perhaps a drawing software? Yeah, I mean, one, I mean, there's advantages and disadvantages. One advantage of working in kind of a generative way is that you have, you, you have this parameter space and you can really kind of, like the, the computer can help you um, it can help you ideate and you can have a conversation. You can be building a tool that you are then kind of having a conversation with and it can produce a lot of possibilities. For me, there's something very beautiful about just making a sketch and adding sliders, right? And I'll, oftentimes there's this thing where I don't, when I do my sketches and I post them on Instagram, I don't make a lot of sliders because I'm really lazy. I'm just like messing with numbers or connected to the mouse. I'm not, I don't care that much, but when I work with clients, I, I'm constantly like building all of these sliders and these controls. And when you do that, you can see like the design that you've created, it has this, there's this parameter space and they're not, they're not all linear. Like if you move one, then it has a real like impact on the other one. And these, you know, it, if you parameterize your, what you're doing, you can really kind of, kind of find ways to push it in different directions. And that those tools can tell you about it and, you know, and you can, that for me, that's really interesting. But there are moments where it's also like super frustrating. Like I'll have a client that, you know, they will have seen a sketch that I did several years ago and they want me to do something exactly like that. And that it's like, I, I don't know how to do that. Like I know how to build systems, but I don't know how to like make that thing again. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, it's a, it, I, I love it, but it's a challenge sometimes too. You know, and, and also like you have to, you're building your own tools. So if you think about it, if you use something like Photoshop or Illustrator or these software that have, you know, 
thousands and thousands of hours of development and ingenuity and people's time and thought and algorithms inside of them. And it's like, you're like, it's like you're building this thing from scratch, you know? And it's like that part is this kind of cool MacGyver feeling, but also it could be, it's very time consuming. And it's also, there are moments where you can just get caught up in tool building and you forget about making art. T has a question. Hi, um, I was wondering if you could talk more about how you approach ideas that seem out of your technical reach at first. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that the best thing is to kind of like whatever you can do to be making and and kind of creating and prototyping. Um, I the 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 sort of key moments for me have come at times when. I have needed to talk to somebody and when you talk to somebody, they unlock something for you. So for example, um, we worked on this project many years ago called the iWriter. It's like a tool for a paralyzed graffiti writer to help them draw graffiti. And the first week that we were out there in LA working with Temp, this graffiti writer, it was so complicated. It was really hard to calibrate, to take the data from the eyes, which was really not linear and calibrated to the projection. It was just impossible. And then I went to this open source hardware conference like a month later and I was talking to some scientists there and there was a scientist who works with primates and he does eye tracking um, with primates and eye tracking is a way that you with animals you can tell you can kind of understand what animals are thinking about by understanding where they look. And he was like, oh, you need to try this algorithm and this approach and it was like this one conversation where I had gotten to a point where I could articulate the problem. And when you talk to the right person, it's like they unlock a key or they open a door. And I think I'll, oftentimes when I'm struggling, I try to figure out what is that question? How can I articulate the problem? And then whose door do I need to knock on? Um, and oftentimes it's like a single conversation or like a single word, then you'll know what to search for. And then, yeah, you, you find your way. Thank you. There's a bunch of questions around project management. <laughs> yeah. How do you project manage yourself? But also hear from, I hope I'm saying the name right, Santhi. I know a handful of fur furloughed creatives that are used to having a boss project manager are now transitioning to try and do their own thing. And managing their own project is new, overwhelming. How would you help them get started? What's the first step? Yeah. To, managing, to managing your own project. Um, yeah, I mean, I think schedule is really important. So for example, um, one of the things that I have found really helpful is to have um, specific days of the week where you say, for example, like Monday is an inward day. If you have a team, that's when you communicate with your team. That's when you're sort of planning and kind of like focused on inward um, communication. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, try to avoid meetings. Friday is all outward. You know, and if you can have a rhythm, and it's pretty crazy now, actually, because of COVID and working at home, it's actually been really, you know, I have like developed much more of a rhythm than before. And then deadlines help a lot for accountability. When I'm working on projects with clients, one of the things that I really love to do is have weekly calls because, you know, if I if we just have regular communication, then you can just just be showing these small updates and getting a temperature read and those weekly, being really in kind of high, um, finding the right frequency of communication with the client is really helpful. Mm. I don't know, I don't know if I'm the best person for tips for this, so. But, but schedule is like having patterns and is really useful. Maybe a, a different topic. Um, you have, you're a co-creator of Open Frameworks. And in yeah. a way there, you were part of a community and also created a community. Maybe mm -hmm. SFPC was kind of a new version or a different version of doing that with different people where you're creating a community. Can you talk about that a little bit and kind of how yeah. you get involved in that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's generally like one of the kind of key pieces of advice that I give when I'm 
talking when I do these office hours and thinking about kind of advice for students is that community is the most important thing, right? And being in school is great because you are, it's, you have this natural community, right? This natural, like you're in classes with students and in a cohort with students. But once you're out of school, the challenge is how do you find that? And oftentimes you have situations where you get really excited about something and then how do you find other people to communicate with that, that, that too? And I think there are, with open frameworks and with the School for Poetic Computation, those are two examples where I think tools and schools work as magnets. That tools, that these open source tools are, in a way, they're magnets for people to come together and talk about ideas. That actual, the actual value of the tool is really minimal in comparison to the amount of value there is in having a group of people that are sharing code, that are sharing resources, that are sharing ideas. And for me, that's been a real, um, that's been a real joy to discover and to also through my work and the things that I do to try to create, to be a, a kind of, um, in a way, how to yeah, build and grow community. So for example, with Open Frameworks, you know, what some of my favorite memories are at iBeam, we would have these knitting circle days and we invite people to come in and just like share whatever they were working on. And you just see this like immense hunger from the community to just be in a room with other people and talking and sharing ideas. And, and, and it's something to think about right now where it's like even a lot of our concepts of space and time are being flattened, being online and, and, and stuck at home all day is that people are really hungry for moments to come together and talk and to share and, and to um, experiment. And then the School for Poetic Computation has been really beautiful in sort of trying to apply that same, the same kind of feeling, that's kind of magical feeling that I, I felt at iBeam and um, through things like the knitting circles to be, say like, okay, how could we create a space? The biggest challenge right now is how do you, how do you bring that online? So uh, the thing that I love about SFEC is not just the classes, but like the students cooking meals together and teaching workshops to each other and being in a space together and seeing, you know, like all what the collision of ideas and what comes out of it. And I feel like these being online and being in these Zoom calls and stuff, they're, they're great for one to many communication. They're not great for spontaneity they're not great for doc for like the, it was really magical when you started this talk and you had this kind of collective drawing and that was like that is a moment right where you everybody's drawing in the same document and like there are things that we can do that are really beautiful and and have that energy of a dinner party or, a, or like a meal that we cook together that I, I think are the biggest challenge we have now is like how do we, how do we translate those things how do we bring those things online and how do we um how do we make this better because this is what we have right now and like we need we need to make it better um zach i i have a question for you um so i was wondering if you could uh, maybe speak a little bit more about the current status of the open framework community and where yeah. you go in the future um and actually i have like a kind of sub question attached to that um which is what I've been to your previous talk, so I've seen different versions of your talks. And I'm wondering whether you would be open to talk a little bit more about how how open framework community situates in um, this kind of like large landscape of the creative code, and yeah. um, what what does creative code mean or not mean to you? Yeah, um, yeah, it's a really good question. I, I would say open frameworks is about ten years old more than 10 years old um and i think when we started a project this project like we never really planned we never thought about how long it would be going for um and and so when we started we didn't really you know we had no idea i mean it really started as a tool it started at parsons and it started as a tool for just bringing like code into the classroom and and then what happened is that every several every couple of years something would happen that kind of brings the community energy up and that feels almost like there's like a almost you know, kind of gravity 
And then like some gust of wind like brings the energy up. And so for example, with open framework, something the beginning was about computer vision and making computer vision algorithms easier for people to, to, to approach that you didn't, you didn't need to um, be uh, like, have a CS degree to be experimenting with these things. Um, and then, then it kind of dissipated a bit. And then there was a lot of energy, like when the connect was released, you know, and then it's suddenly like, oh, okay, open frameworks is this tool that can talk to this piece of hardware that allows me to see the world in a new way. And then it was like, okay, we can make apps for the phone. Like we can make, now we have this new device, like an iPhone and an Android phone that we can make apps for it using um, this language, which we know well, and, and, and we can make experimental tools. Um, then it was things like Raspberry Pi. Like we have this small computer and like, okay, open frameworks can run on it. And so every so often it feels like there's a kind of gust of, like a burst of wind and that burst of wind, like bring, then the community gets more active. And, and I think that's been, at the moment it's like, maybe like, there's, I don't know what the next burst of wind is gonna be, but we're in, a, in this sort of pattern. Um, we did have a really nice meeting like a community development meeting earlier this year at um, in Denver, where we talked about kind of some of the future plans. Um, the main thing is that when we set up open firmers, we didn't really set it up in a way to be sustainable. We had no idea how much time it would take and how long it would go. So we were really like, we, we work at a very slow pace, but it's, that's kind of open, you know, one way of thinking about open source software. The one thing I would say is that I'm really, glad to see models like um, the Processing Foundation and P5JS that have this very like sustainable way of saying, okay, we're gonna have a leadership position, we're gonna pay people money for it. And that, that's something that we had no, we didn't plan for, we didn't think about. And, I, and to me that represents a kind of like next generation thinking in terms of how community, how these tools should be supported. I, you know, I don't know what the, Future. I mean, we're still develop. We're still working on open frameworks. It's still like you know, I still teach with it, and still see a lot of interesting people, you know, interesting projects that come out of it. Um, I do think you know there are there are things ebb and flow, and there are different moments where tools really shine. Um, I strongly believe there's a place for you know free open source toolkits. There's a lot of power when you use something like Unity or where you use you know. Um, touch designer, or, you know, these things are, are like very powerful, but they're also commercial platforms. And I've lived through enough moments of seeing commercial platforms like get really big and then die that I feel so much anxiety. If you think about how much of like Flash applet, like you can't see Flash, you know, how much content was created with Flash and then it's like not visible anymore. Even Java, like Java applets that you can't see anymore. It's like, I feel, um, really invested in a free open source tools that um you know that kind of stand stand up the stand the test of time thank you we're almost running out of time maybe last question from io hey zach uh, thank you so uh, much it was really really amazing um i have a question it's um more about it's, it's about life and about um challenges and you know as as professionals you know we face challenges all the time and we try to meet those challenges head-on I wanted you to I want I would like you to speak to how you address like big big challenges um, I'm thinking about you know let's say your studio gets you know you have to move your studio <laughs> or <laughs> or you know you don't get a contract that you want um, yeah or or you get stuck in a situation like we are now with covid like not yeah, only yeah. not only in terms of how do you continue to work right but how do you keep motivated and how do you sort of plan for the future in a time like this and i especially for the students that are graduating you know I'd like um, you to speak on that a little if you could yeah yeah i mean it's really i mean the the one thing I would say is, I think it's really important to be kind to yourself and tender in this moment where like, it's really difficult. It was really, really challenging. And, and I, I think it's like challenging 
it's challenging for students, it's challenging for, challenging for teachers, it's challenging, you know, if you have gone to a master's program and you had your, you know, you were going to have like a thesis show and you're working on your thesis and it's like, you have this vision in your mind of what your life is going to be like and dealing with the cha those changes and kind of realizations, like that can be really, it can be really difficult. And I, I think this is a moment for really being tender and being, um, and really being easy. So like, I, I, I don't know, I don't know the best way to answer that question. I would just say like what I, what's brought me a lot of joy is, you know, walking, like I just walk around my neighborhood and I try to take photographs of all the signs and signage. Like it's this amazing moment where stores are closed down, but you just see these signs like, you know, like we miss, you know, we'll be back or like we're closed or, you know, even like how to, how to interact with the store. And, and, and I just felt like, okay, this is a, this is a moment I want to document and I want to find a creative act. And like, maybe the creative act is just like taking a photograph and I'm going to, whenever I see something that seems strange, I'm just going to like, I'm just going to try to take a photograph of it and remember this moment. Um, and, and that, that creative act is a reminder that, that I should be present. That creative act is a reminder to try to be, to be there and be present. Um, I, I really hate, I hate that energy right now of like, okay, everybody's at home. Let's be like super productive. Let's, you know, let's like, we're going to be in like do all this amazing work. And, you know, I feel like if you need to play video games, play video games. Like if you need to, you know, you should do, you should do, you should take care of yourself at this moment. Like that's my, my main, um, message. And one of the things that I, I wrote to my, this is a re really beautiful letter that a professor at Brown wrote to her students. And I sent this to my, I forwarded it to my students. And she basically said like, you all pass, you all graduate, but like the rest of the semester is for you. Like it's your, you should read the books because I think you will, you will get a lot out of them. But like you, you know, this, this moment, this time is for you. It's not for me. It's not for, for graduating, you're going to graduate, like use this moment for you. So that, I guess that that's what I would say. Um, somebody asked, do you know the name of the professor? I'll, I'll try to find it. I'll send it to oh, Richard. Cool. So, yeah. Awesome. Uh, and we're out of time. We have a mini tradition here. So um, everybody, please go off of mute and we'll just snap our fingers. <laughs> Thank you, Zach. Thank you, Zach.